Make a video on MGM already for Satan's sake. Weebo, you need to make a video on MGM. Make a video on MGM. Don't make a video on MGM right now. The rights of baby boys are being violated. If I make a suggestion, you should make a video on issues. mutilation and how it is harmful. Weebo Jones, children. When are you going to an interesting topic you can cover? Would be just MGM. Weebo Jones, major mistake. She needs to hear you about general mutilation. Now, Jay, thou shalt not cause her to be better. MGM, until she comes to that video. Weebo, babe, cover the anti-MGM video on MGM. Never give the choice to baby boys. Do a video about circumcision. Do a video on circumcision. You should do a video on circumcision. I see it's our way out of the highway. She either addresses the issue or the channel with no survivors. process begin today kids we'll be talking about the snip now I have a question to start us off if you have a micro penis can you actually be circumcised Meany peeny warning this video contains conversations of extremely sensitive nature to the male erectile system which may cause flinching mild discomfort boner wilting peen shriveling depression inverted mangina nausea and possibly even death you have been warned now that I've pissed everyone off with that opening skit, let's talk about male genital mutilation, aka circumcision. I'm going to be upfront with my personal position on the matter right off the bat, just so we can get that out of the way. I am anti-infant circumcision on the pure and simple basis that there is just something that rubs me the wrong way about performing a surgery on an infant that has absolutely no wherewithal or ability to consent to said surgery, a surgery that has no immediate life-saving surgical purposes. Poking and slicing and permanently altering a child's body doesn't sit well with me. I feel like that's a decision that said person who it's being done to should be able to make when they're old enough to decide for themselves whether or not they want that to be a thing. I hold the same stance on piercing your kid's ears, on surgical gender assignment of intersex infants, and on child hormone therapies as well. Wait for them to get older. Much older. Simply put, for me, if it isn't life-threatening, take the path of least resistance. Call it lazy, but I won't be responsible for permanent body modifications of people if I don't have to be. That being said, we will still be talking about this as objectively as possible. I will be looking at all arguments for and against providing as much information as possible for everyone so that they can decide for their own if this is what they want to do. I'm not going to tell anyone what to do. As per usual, all of my factoids have been sourced in the description down below. Feel free to go ham on them if you feel the need to. So, circumcision is defined as the surgical removal of the foreskin, which is the skin covering the tip of the penis. A common practice in the US, Africa, and the Middle East, not so common in Europe, 
however. Typically, circumcisions are performed on newborn male infants for either personal or religious reasons, although they can be performed on elder children and even adults to treat the following health issues. Atlantis, which is the swelling of foreskin. Bellanopostistis, inflammation of the tip and the foreskin. Paranphimosis, the inability to return a retracted foreskin to its original position. And phimosis, the inability to retract the foreskin. So, believe it or not, there are immediate medical reasons as to why one would have their foreskin removed. Contrary to what the gents in my comments section believe, it's not a wholesale medically pointless procedure. Although the caveat to those procedures are that Blantis, while common in uncircumcised males, is at an epidemic rate of 3 to 11 percent, depending on the statistic that you look at. It's usually associated with poor hygiene, candida, psoriasis, irritation, and bacterial infection, rough handling, allergy, medication, and diabetes. Balano post this this fuck me up, that word is hard. Um, the causes of which are penile yeast infections, chlamydia, fungal infections, gonorrhea, herpes simplex, human papillomavirus, primary or secondary syphilis, trichomoniasis, <laughs> canceroid, chronic, volantis, eczema, injuries, accidents, irritation caused by rubbing or scratching, irritation from exposure to chemicals, psoriasis, retractive arthritis, type 4 skin. You get the picture. Paraphimosis affects fewer than 1% of males over the age of 16 in the U.S. and causes our bacterial infection, catheterization, poor hygiene, swelling, producing injury, vigorous sexual intercourse, etc. Phimosis affects fewer than 1% of boys, causes being that of scar tissue, pull and stretch, aging, and medical conditions. The obvious implication you hear gents is to take care of your weenie, please and thank you. It's, it's, it's within your best interest, essentially. I encourage you to take care of your weenie. Please. So, as I mentioned, the non-immediately medical reasons as to why people circumcise their children center around religious traditions. Both Judaism and Islamic religious doctrine dictate that newborn boys be circumcised. But in addition to those traditional reasons, parents circumcise their children for aesthetic preferences. So some fathers desire to have their sons look like them, I guess, is one of the reasons listed that I could find, as well as to lower the risk of some conditions. Now, the only non-personal reason as to why one would circumcise their child present on that list would be to lower the risk of some health conditions. So what are they? Well, the first and foremost one is that it decreases risk of UTIs in infancy. It is estimated that 10 of 1,000, 1%, uncircumcised male infants will develop a UTI during the first year of life, compared with one of 1,000.1% circumcised male infants. But it should be noted that regardless of the condition of one's penis, or in fact regardless of even the presence of a penis, UTIs in early childhood are still rather common, as far as I could gather for males and females circumcised and uncircumcised males. The next point is that supposedly it reduces the prevalence of penile cancer. Now, this is it's not... The reason I say supposedly is that there's not as much information surrounding this claim due to the limited knowledge about timing and the role of circumcision in the etiology of penile cancer risk factors due to there being more direct contributing factors and the occurrences being reduced from a rate already established as rare to begin with. To, to brave a comparison and my justification for why this isn't necessarily enough of an argument alone for me to at least endorse circumcision as a preventative health risk measure. A hysterectomy also reduces the rate of ovarian cancer, but doesn't completely remove the possibility of having that occur. Same case with penile cancer. This begs the question of whether the risk of uncertain hypotheticals are worth braving surgical pr procedures. That is opening up your entire immune system to risk of infection, and other health risk factors. Now that's a decision that I believe should be made on a case-by-case -case basis left up to the parties involved, not for anyone else to regulate outright from the get-go legally or what have you. The next point is that it decreases risk of sexually transmitted diseases including female to male transmission of HIV. Yes, tis true on certain levels, but not so true on other levels. It's a mixed bag, don't you know? Now, in the review article entitled Sexually Transmitted Infections and Male Circumcision, a systemic review and meta-analysis from 2013, Robert Van Howey of the Department of Pediatrics and Human Development, Michigan State University College of Human Medicine writes, 
that was a mouthful. Chlamydia, gonorrhea, genital herpes, and human papillomavirus are not significantly impacted by circumcision. Syphilis shows mixed results, with studies of prevalence suggesting intact men were at great risk and studies of incidence suggesting the opposite. Intact men appear to be of greater risk for genital ulcerative disease, while at lower risk for genital discharge syndromes, nonspecific urethritis, genital warts, and overall risk of any sexually transmitted infection. In studies of general populations, there is no clear or consistent positive impact of circumcision on the risk of indi individually sexually transmitted infections. But you know what also decreases the risk of sexually transmitted diseases? Abstinence. Hate to be that person, but I will be. Also, using protection and not having sex with random strangers. The point I'm trying to make here is, guys, you don't have to resort to slicing off the tip of your dick just to reduce your risk for an STD. There are easier and much simpler ways to go about doing that. <laughs> having said that, let's go on to the next reason. Now, circumcision decreases the risk of cervical cancer and some infections in female partners. Now, this point, it, it kind of took me aback when I read about it, because as you well know, an action taken directly upon the body of one person doesn't really affect the health of another person. Typically. That would be like saying amputating my own leg stops you from developing foot fungus. The association was lost on me until I looked further into it. And even now, it's kind of precarious in terms of association. Apparently, the logic behind this reasoning is simply this. If we grant that men who are uncircumcised have a higher risk of contracting STIs, and thus are more likely to pass on said STI to their partner in life, and if that STI happens to be HPV, a uh, woman's chances of developing cervical cancer rise if her partner is passed on HPV to her. You see, a lot of things have to fall into place for this to be relevant to the conversation about circumcision. It's a very indirect connection as far as I'm concerned, and again, there are easier ways to counteract this potentiality rather than going under the knife, but that's just me. The next reason is that it makes it easier to maintain good genital hygiene, which, to me, at least, is like saying having no teeth makes it easier to maintain dental hygiene. I'm sorry, but that's not nearly reason enough for me to subject an infant who can't consent to an unnecessary surgical procedure at birth. So, okay, maybe maybe those just single-digit percentage health risks and what have you are enough of a threat to your baby boy that it convinces you that circumcision is in fact the way to go because little Timmy is so precious to the world, guys. Yes. Let me just give you some more things to consider because you see, I've only been discounting the cited potential health benefits of circumcision thus far. What I haven't done yet is outline the potential risk factors of circumcision. So the long list of complications of circumcision include things such as bleeding, death, infections, insufficient foreskin removal, excessive foreskin removal, uh, adhesion slash skin bridges, inclusion cysts, abnormal healing, metis, metal stenosis, urinary retention, phimosis, interestingly, one of the things that you circumcise for medically can actually be caused by circumcision, so I thought that was pretty cool. Not cool, interesting. Uh, cordy, hypospidius, epispedis, necrosis of the penis, amputation of the glands, etc. Now, it should be noted, all of these are to some varying degrees of rarity. You'll be interested to know that there is no universal and acknowledged study that compiles data on infant circumcision complications, and there's a reason for that. For example, in the case of bleeding complications, in one prospective study, 9.87% of circumcisions resulted in abnormal bleeding, whereas a retrospective chart review found a rate for hemorrhage of 1%, and a database search found excessive bleeding in 0.083%. In the cases of infections, we have a little bit more. Guillain and Cell reported an infection rate in newborns in the immediate post-circumcision period of 0.4%. But Cell reported on a series of 100 consecutive circumcisions found infection in 8 cases, with one serious enough to require antibiotics and one progressing to fibrosis and phimosis. And phimosis. B and Ansel found a five-fold increase in infection risk in boys circumcised with the Plastibel device compared to the Goman clamp. Some more interesting factoids. Ironically, increased incidences of UTIs in early post-circumcision periods have been found to correlate with ritual circumcisions. And then there's the pain factor. There's there's lots of pain. I mean, you're cutting into skin and the tip of the penis, no less. So, 
I mean, you think getting kicked in the dick hurts. Oh boy, imagine. Now the real kicker here is actually that of, of, of the physicians, physicians, mind you, not religious practitioners that perform circumcision, only about 45% use anesthesia. Now I could go on, I honestly could, but I'd be here like all day if I went into every single possible what if con that can occur during a circumcision. But that's what this is. Outside of the argument for it, due to religious traditions and, you know, aesthetic purposes, this is a conversation of the medical what-ifs of circumcisions versus the medical what-ifs of non-circumcisions. I can't tell you what to do. I can't make any decisions for you about this, and I'm not going to. The one thing that I will urge is that if you do decide to circumcise your child, have a medical professional do it and make sure that that medical professional is well trained. Because I want the best possible outcome for your child, even if that includes circumcising your child. I've provided you with more than enough resources for you to get yourself started in the education process. And should you feel the need to go looking through them for more information, all those links will be in the description down below. Now, I think my job here is done, at least for the time being. I hope that I at least got you started thinking. If you like what I'm doing here, you can check out the links in the description to my Amazon, Patreon, and Teespring store. If you don't like what I'm doing that much, enough that you want to pay me, that's totally cool. You can always like, comment, share, and subscribe for more. Also, don't forget to hit that bell so you actually get notified whenever I post a video because YouTube hates me, but also everyone. If you want to see more of me, maybe not on this channel, and maybe not within the video capacity, I do do an RPG D&D-esque streaming show every Monday night from 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Magog of Morscar's channel. And I also do a bi-weekly stream about the news, advice, and what have you, and the going-ons and more, Sundays and Wednesdays from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Some Dumb Americans' channel. Links to both of their channels down in the description. Peace, bitches.